So let's start out with entertaining in the new Tertarian home. How many of you have, do any of you ever throw dinner parties? Oh, yeah. Do you? Great, great. You don't have to stop just because you're eating this way, but like I said, this is the food you're going to serve for your next dinner party. So here's a few things that will help you uh, with, with that. I want you to offer familiar foods, and we'll talk in a little while about crossover dishes for sad eaters. So dishes that easily will be like, they'll think it's yummy, and they'll have no clue that there's no you know, animal products in it. And, by, and quietly serve it up. By this I mean, you know, I've been to a lot of places where, you know, people are so proud to be a vegan or a raw diet person and they, they declare it from the mountaintops that everything you're eating tonight is raw and doesn't have... You don't need to shout it from the rooftops that this doesn't have salt, sugar, or oil. Just serve it. Serve it up. Okay? Don't make excuses. Don't say, well... You know, it doesn't have any meat in it, so you might not like it. Don't apologize for your food before you serve it. That's one way to really turn people off. They're going to have a negative opinion of it already from the get-go. So don't tell them what it is other than what the ingredients are. Don't tell them what it's lacking. Just tell them what the ingredients are and let them be the judge. Okay? I want you to challenge your guests when you have them over. You, we all have friends that say, oh, I hate kale. It's bitter. It's chew, it's, it sticks in my teeth. Well, we had that delicious orange sesame kale slaw the other day with the avocado and the oranges on it. That's what I use for people that tell me they don't like kale. I say, eat this and tell me you don't. I don't, I don't even tell them it's kale. I just say, here's a slaw. Try this. And they're like, this is really good. And I'll say, it's kale. And they'll be like, really? So... <laughs> You know, challenge them. I get a lot of people that think mushrooms are, don't like mushrooms. Oh, <laughs> um, the texture is slimy. I don't know what, I don't I love mushrooms. I don't know how you can't lo love mushrooms. It's like not, not liking chocolate. I mean, I don't know. But anyway, make something with mushrooms the way I showed you the other day how to roast them. They're delicious. The people will love them. Um, and being a gracious guest. This is the toughest one, I think. What do you do when somebody invites you to their house for a dinner party and you need to stick to this diet? Okay? That's a tough one. This is what I do. I talk to them and I say, well, you know, I have... I have, a, I have special needs, dietary needs, and I say I would, be, I would love to be able to bring a salad dressing for everybody to try, and maybe a dessert, and maybe a soup or something. And that way you know, <laughs> right, you actually bring, you know, bring a little bit. I'm serious, I'm serious. I bring a little thing of dressing, so there's enough for whoever, however, if that's a dinner party for six or eight, bring enough dressing so everybody can at least taste it. You know, find out what your, uh, your host is serving. If they're serving like a regular salad, just say, can you um, just not dress mine? And then let everybody else sample the dressings. It's a good learning experience for them. I mean, if you gave them like that Asian ginger dressing, they wouldn't know that difference from the Benihana at the, at the restaurant. So, you know, and they're going to say, wow, this is really good. So let, let the other people just taste it. And it, then it doesn't appear that you're being rude. It appears that you're being generous and you're bringing all this stuff. So it may be a little bit more work to go to somebody else's house for a dinner party, but I think it's worth it in the long run. You're going to get them to, to be like, oh, wow, I, I brought uh, peppermint patty ice cream. The last dinner party I went to, I brought, I think I brought the um, apple pecan dressing. I, it was in the wintertime, and I brought the peppermint patty ice cream, and I brought the lucky black-eyed peas. And... Um, and I just brought it enough for everybody to have a little sample along with whatever the host was serving. And everybody loved it and was very appreciative and grateful that I brought the, brought the thing. So, and then you only ate your food? Then I only ate my food, yes. <laughs> I have the big portion. You know, not too many. If, if people are that concerned about what you're eating, then they've got some issues, I think. <laughs> you know? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so let's go back and we're going to talk about some crossover dishes for sad people. Um, <clears throat> the first option is always pasta because pasta traditionally doesn't have an animal product associated with it. In Italy, pasta is like a side dish that's just pasta and tomato sauce. 
in a lot of Italian restaurants, that's how it is. So it's kind of a, an accompaniment dish. So people don't necessarily um, expect to have a piece of meat or chunks of meat in their pasta. So pasta is a pretty easy thing to serve that everybody, everybody likes pasta. Um, and we're going to have a bunch of different ones tonight on the pasta bar. Um, we're gonna, tonight we're having the pasta with Brussels sprouts and blue cheese. And um, this is a really good sauce. I, I'm, I, I made this recipe and it's not like, it doesn't scream blue cheese, but it's close enough. It's got a little zing, it's got a little, you know, it's, it's close enough, but it's a delicious sauce nonetheless, and it, and it really blends well. Blue cheese and Brussels sprouts is a great combination, and, as with apples. So you'll see on the recipe, um, the things that make it cheesy are the yeast, and the Dijon mustard is another thing. Uh, 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 I talked about the Whole Foods 365 Dijon. I really like that one, and that, it, whenever you add mustard to a sauce, it does add a cheesiness, so that's a good a good additive to think about if you want something to taste cheesier, Dijon mustard and nutritional yeast. And we have the optional additions of apples and mushrooms you could put in this dish. And then we have the pasta with cauliflower and salsa di noci. This is a pretty traditional walnut sauce. If any of you are Italian, uh, are you any of you Italian? Your, your Nana? I have this great, uh, Actually, no, it's called Nona's Italian Kitchen. It's a vegan Italian book, but she's got a walnut sauce in there. I basically copied that. I think I, I think there was olive oil in it or something that I took out. But other than that, it was, it's pretty, um, it's pretty standard walnuts, traditional Italian walnut sauce, and it's just flavored with a little marjoram, no, no salt, no pepper. And then I, I, I stir in some spinach to give it some added nutritional value. And you've got your cruciferous cauliflower and your beans and your pasta. So it's a really well-rounded dish for the G-bombs, but uh, also very tasty. OK, another great crossover dish is Mexican food. And when I say Mexican food, I'm I'm really talking about Americanized Mexican food. I'm not talking about traditional Mexican food. Um, but what you see at, at you know, any of the Mexican restaurants in America, basically the, there's seven components to any Mexican dish. And Taco Bell is a great example of this because they have, you know, they have 15 different things on their menu, but they all use all the same seven ingredients in different carnations. It's the incarnations. It's like, you know, there's a crispy corn tortilla or a soft corn tor tortilla or a crispy uh, wheat tortilla or a, or a soft wheat tortilla and there's taco size and there's burrito size and some are rolled and some are in half, but it's all the same, right? <laughs> it's all the same ingredients, the same seven ingredients. So, so it's really easy to make Mexican food in, in Nutritarian. Instead of the meat, we just choose what we want to be the focus of the dish, which could be mushrooms or any sort of veg any vegetables that you like. The cheese, uh, the cheesiness, we, we can use our once, once or twice a month cheese allotment of the Daya cheese and, and put it in our burrito, or just use some nutritional yeast to give it a yeasty or a cheesy flavor. Uh, refried beans, uh, we're going to have the tostadas for lunch today, so you'll, you'll taste the refried lentils. I use lentils, you don't always have to use beans, but um, there's a, the recipe is in the book for the uh, refried uh, Lentils, I think it is anyway. Yes, there it is. And it's easy. You don't even have to cook them, really. Just heat them up. You put them in your food processor, process them with all those things. The tomato paste, cumin, garlic powder, onion powder, lime juice, and chili powder. And uh, that recipe's missing the chili powder. I'm not exactly sure why. Oh, it says divided. It's at the beginning. I see. Okay. Um, so you just whir those in your food processor and you got a big batch of beans, uh, refried beans. Um, the corn or flour tortillas, we already went, went through which ones are acceptable for us to use. The food for life, the Ezekiel, are good there. The sour cream we had on the chili the other day, um, great sour cream substitute. Salsa, basically salsa is okay. Um, most commercial salsas, it would be okay if they just didn't put in the salt. So you just make your own without the salt. It's pretty, it's pretty standard. I think uh, there's a recipe coming up here yet. 
And guacamole is uh, also not uh, difficult to make just without salt. So here we have that. Oh, here's the recipe for the salsa. It's onions, garlic, red pepper, chipotle, fire roasted tomatoes, apple cider vinegar, cilantro. This is a cooked salsa, but you could also do a... Um, pico de gallo. Thank you, pico de gallo. The raw chopped tomato, with the same kind of ingredients, fresh tomatoes, onions, garlic, red pepper, cilantro. And then we're going to get to the guacamole. One of my pet peeves about Mexican food is when, when they make the guacamole spicy. I think of Mexican food as a kind of a hurt relief kind of cuisine. <laughs> There's like the hurt comes from all the chilies and the heat and you, you bite in and then you get some sour cream and you're like, ah. Oh. And then you take another bite of heat and then you take guacamole and you're like, ah. Oh. So you don't want ow and then ow again with the guacamole. So guacamole should be avocados, lime juice, cilantro, onion. Simple as that. You could stir in some chopped tomatoes if you really want. But no, no heat. No heat in guacamole. This is supposed to be a relief element in the dish. And then here's the cashew sour cream. Uh, that, that's in there too. Is it? I think it's with the chili recipe. Oh, okay. It's in the workbook at some point. Is it in there? Oh, wow. It's all right here. It is, it is all right here. Okay, and then we're going to talk about... Oh, here's the refried beans. So you just put all those things. This says tomato powder. I buy a powdered dried tomato. It's just easy to bump up tomato flavor without adding any liquid. So a lot of times if my soup's the right consistency, but it just needs a little bit more tomato, I'll stir in some dry... Uh, it's, it's basically freeze-dried tomatoes that are powdered. And you can buy it on Amazon uh, or any of the spice websites. Um, they all pretty much all sell tomato powder these days. It's a lot more common than it used to be. Just make sure it's one ingredient, like we talked about, one ingredient, tomatoes. And you just whir all this stuff in the food processor. It's pretty easy. And then another crossover dish is obviously chili. If you have your guests over, you can do a chili bar and do all these same things we did with the Mexican food. Have a, have a dish of diet cheese out, have some guacamole, sour cream, salsa, and some baked tortilla chips, corn chips, and a big pot of chili and have guests build their own chili. It's great fun. And, and you've had the chili already. This is the, we had the four bean and butternut squash, but it's, it's basically the same recipe. It's, it's a delicious recipe. Works really well for sad eaters. They don't miss the meat in that one, I don't think. And then here, here we have the vanilla sabayon that we had last night. Did you all like that? Okay. It's a really it's a really good dessert for sad eaters because it's it's sweet, it's berries, it's it's just very simple, but the everybody loves vanilla and sweet and berries, so it really works well on all levels to get for and it's and it's really simple to make, too. So, um Yeah, I don't know what else, what much else to say about it. It's pretty easy these things in the in the blender blend it up. I put in some garbanzo beans to give it a a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, lower the glycemic a little bit of the dates. So you can sweeten it pretty sweet and put the garbanzo beans in to make it, keep it a little tame. How long will that last in the refrigerator? The sabayon will probably, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it more than three days. There's really no, there's no acid in there to keep it. So I would, uh, I would give it three days tops, but, but it's freezable. So make a big blender full and eat whatever and, you know, put it in little cartons and freeze it. I set this alarm on purpose. Oh. It's me. I set it on purpose because we're all going to get up and stand up. Oh, I'll talk about that. But everybody stand up. How, how many of you work in an, uh, in a, at a desk all day and sit behind a computer all day? 
Okay, very dangerous to sit there for all these hours, and it's very dangerous for us to sit here and listen to me blab all these hours, too. <laughs> so I want you, I have a client that she works 14-hour days in front of a computer. I make her set an alarm for every 30 minutes, and she has to get up and walk around the office and go back and then reset the alarm and continue working. So I want you all... Well, we'll talk about topped and tailed while we're walking in place, because we're not. Gonna, I don't want to create chaos here. <laughs> but I want you to get up and walk in place. Topped and tailed is just clip the ends off either with the scissors, because you can use the whole bean. The pot itself is not bitter, and you're blending it up anyway, so it doesn't matter. The only reason they scrape out is because you don't want to eat the bean in your mouth. Like it's chew, it's gross in your mouth. But we're blending it up, so use the whole bean. All right. Keep going. You're, gonna, you're still standing. You got to stand for this whole story. Okay. And it's a long one, so keep. No, you can sit down if you want to, but I'd rather see you stay up for a little bit. This is a story from a, a Zen Buddhist chef named Edward S. B. Brown. He works. He used to work. I'm not sure if he's still at Tassajara, but Tassajara was a Zen center. I love his cookbook because he has little spiritual stories about cooking that have inspired me. And I'm going to talk to you about this one first. And I'm just going to read it to you, and hopefully it'll be a dramatic enough reading. It's called An Offering. What is it that brings people back again and again to the task of feeding, whether the work be a drudgery or a joy? Back to dreaming up what to cook and how to cook it back to agonizing over delighting in what to serve, and back to wondering whether the results are praiseworthy and whether those eating are sufficiently appreciative of all the sacrifice. <laughs> Years ago at Tassajara, we had a festive picnic in the early afternoon. I remember walking over the hill to the horse pasture. A great deal of effort had gone into the preparations, and people ate eagerly and with gusto. Walking in the fresh air stimulated our appetite for good food, laughter, gaiety, companionship. Sometimes one attains, for a few moments at least, a heavenly state. Sunshine, grasses, wildflowers in bloom, the fleeting and buoyant fragrances of spring and food. Without having to do a single thing, food appears. Miraculously, as though born on the wind, even before the wish is made, everything is there. As often happens when things come unasked for, both pleasant and painful, people did not think to say thank you that day. Joy, ease, well-being arose, and everybody was replete and sated, and not especially interested in lining up to thank the cooks, the gods, or divine providence. Oh well, the, the euphoria of, cooks, of the cooks on a bright spring afternoon which was edged with bitterness. Maybe next time we won't work so hard if you cannot express more appreciation. <laughs> Later in the afternoon, I was back in the kitchen at the appointed time. No one else appeared. The other cooks had joined in the general day off, ignoring the well-known dictum that cooking never stops, the kitchen never closes. Even though we'd had a large picnic lunch, people would be expecting a little something when the dinner bell rang. Unthanked and now abandoned by my crew, I had little sympathy for what anyone might be expecting. I was, after all, expecting gratitude and plaudits. I was expecting assistance. If you're not going to notice that I'm cooking, let's see if you notice that I'm not. <laughs> Why don't I disappear? That will show them. But will it? What will it show them? I fear they will not understand that it's all their fault for not thanking me enough. Before I can get out of the kitchen, further reflection sets in. Do I just get, give to get? That's not really giving then. That's called buying and trying to work a favorable deal. That's called bargaining. I want to be more generous than that. I want to really give, no strings attached. It's almost over. Hold on. Could I do this, no strings attached? Just cook and let it go at that. I began sorting through the leftovers, dinner at the usual time. The cook's job is to embody generosity, just as it is the work of the people eating to be grateful, even if wordlessly. Still, cooks survive better when they focus on their own endeavor and don't try to tell others how they are supposed to react. <laughs> cook and let it go at that. To wit a story, and this is shorter. In our meditation tradition, we have a custom which for many years I found peculiar, 
offering food to Buddha. They do this at the Zen Center. Every meal they offer a little thing to Buddha. Before breakfast and lunch, the cooks make up a small tray of food. It's rather cute, suggestive of dollhouse cuisine. Food is put delicately into each little dish, and then a miniature spoon and chopsticks are set ready to use. When I was cooking, I found this rather annoying. Wasn't I busy enough serving food to the community without having to serve food to someone who's not even going to eat it? You have to be kidding. Whatever is the point. Later, when I collected the uneaten food, the Buddha didn't say anything about liking this or not liking that. No, no, love the seasoning on the carrots. No, the Buddha just goes on sitting there completely unconcerned. Good food the Buddha doesn't praise. Bad food the Buddha does not complain about. Not a word escapes his lips, just as no food escapes his bowls. I think that's supposed to be bowels, but it says bowls. <laughs> How inane, I thought. When Jakusho Bill Kwong came to visit the first summer I was cooking at Tessahara, I watched him make up the offering tray. Jakusho teaches now at the Sonoma Mountain Zen Center, and he had been the cook at the Zen Center when I first arrived. I could not believe how polite and respectful he was while putting food into those tiny bowls. Careful, sincere, unhurried, as though serving the most honored of guests. Please try this, I'm sure you'll like it. How sweetly he served the food, which was to be uneaten and unremarked upon. Perhaps 25 years later, it occurred to me that serving food to Buddha in this fashion was utterly profound. This is the way to cook. Cook the food and serve it. Bow and depart. You've done your part. Offer what you have to offer. Let go and walk away. That's the end of it. How the guests receive it is up to them. How the guests receive it is up to them. Main point.